let's move so uh, now to some concepts a little bit more specific all right uh, we've seen the, the intuition behind uh behind the, the lean startup why it emerged uh some of the main concepts and and this kind of things but let's go to what the author of the methodology says okay first idea entrepreneurs are everywhere we have to avoid the entrepreneurial myth is someone from silicon valley with a groundbreaking idea uh, with excellent skills no there is actually like the scientific method that anybody uh, by applying the scientific method so pretty much anybody by applying the entrepreneurial method it could be lean startup about any other method can become an entrepreneur okay and actually there are um plenty of uh, uh research streams trying to understand what it's called entrepreneurial spirit right it's not i mean you may be a potential entrepreneur or you can have a, a an entrepreneurial spirit and actually not become an entrepreneur a de facto entrepreneur okay you you may not start a company for whatever reasons for lack of resources network or or anything okay so that it's that it's uh one of the points that sometimes it seems obvious but we tend to overlook it okay the second thing is that entrepreneurship is at the end of the day it's just management it's just a different kind of management you cannot apply uh, uh, we just saw you cannot apply the the general management practices because they don't apply when when uncertainty is the key you know a, a startup doesn't even know if they will survive if they will have the salary to pay uh, sorry money to pay the salaries next month next 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 month so um general management practices cannot be applied here right it has to be context sensitive then the third thing this sorry the third concept is what it's called validated learning and again uh let's be very cautious about this by validated here it just i have five, more than five customers who say this is not working let's 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 assume it's it's true okay if i was wrong because the sample was too small or because i didn't choose the sample correctly and i asked the, the wrong customers don't worry in the next iteration it will be just in one week two weeks uh, we will find out all right so the key concept here is validated learning learn as quickly as possible then i already mentioned it and we have a slide now for this but uh, the build measure learn uh, approach uh, again this is as we talked at the beginning about the cargo code uh, it's, it's not just you implement this approach and everything will work you need to understand that the logic behind this why do we want to build measure and learn in what order what things are the most important and how to integrate this feedback in the into the um, the procedure okay and finally um for those of you more um, uh, familiar with uh, accounting innovation accounting innovation accounting this is also that uh, any company first because it's a is a legal obligation needs to to record their transactions through their accounting team or external accountant or, or anything but accounting it comes from accountability how do we hold accountable those people doing things but in a startup we don't even know as i said we didn't we don't even know who we are yet maybe next month we will change who we are what we do we have evolved the product okay so how do we hold people accountable so we have to change the practices we don't we don't manage people we don't manage the team we don't control the team or or the procedures by recording how much money we spent in something it's about how much we learn how many contacts we we made how many interviews okay and then okay we've been <laughs> just to to, to to end up okay but after all these what is what is a startup because we are talking about lean startup right but what is it a startup and the truth is mm, well I, i've participated in even um in public uh, public auditions uh, the government asking for uh for advice from expert panels etc and there is no real consensus there are some traditional definitions so the person who who defined the concept initially i mean they, they have something to say right the concept has evolved in practice people use it differently uh, some people pay more attention to uh, to certain uh, attributes of a startup or or not so I will give you my idea. Okay, I will give you my idea. A startup traditionally 
traditionally is a technological company. So it has to be like either with a very strong technological or knowledge based uh, project, which, for example, for 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 this audience is is great, right? Is it's pretty much as technological or, or knowledge based as it can get. Um, second, it has to have the potential for growth. All right. If it's a company which is great, and we need those companies, all right, in society. If it's just a small company, just like a small store in a, in a city or or anything, that's great. But that is not a startup, and I mean, for that for that kind of project, you would not even need lean startup. Okay, if you want to open a grocery store in your city or something like that, or a or a um, um, clothes store or something similar. Scalability. This is one of the most controversial uh, attributes because the scalability, it means basically like the the um, theoretical definition is just that as you grow, your revenue grows uh, faster than your costs. Okay. So for example, if you sell clothes and you want to open a second store, you need to have to, um, to rent a second um, second place and you need to hire a second team sales team right so if you want to open a third store you need to rent uh, a third place and a third team right? like you need to rent people but for example let's give an example of a software if i have a software company uh, you just need to download for example google chrome you can use google chrome and you can have uh, five thousand million people it's a little bit too much but one thousand million people in the world using Google Chrome and the cost, the, the what it's called the marginal cost, the extra cost for Google is zero. It's 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 negligible. Okay. So that is what it's in this context is what it's associated with the concept of scalability. Okay. It's not just you can replicate, you can grow, no, you need to scale. All right. But among all these features, for me, that's why I highlighted this, the real one that defines what a startup is is uncertainty, and a startup, it's what they what it's called an experiment. Once you stop, you stop experimenting, probably it's because you found product market fit, as we saw earlier, and then that means you are not startup anymore. You know who you are. You know who your customers are. You know that they are willing to pay for your product. So now it, your your goal change to let's survive let's find our customers and make sure that they want to buy the product we're building that this is useful for them and it creates value to how do we start growing the company okay we have 20 customers they love the product how do we go to 50 100 a thousand a million all right and then we mentioned this also earlier okay after product market feed product market feed is so important in itself is a milestone and it makes many times it it signals the change from being a startup to scale up okay all right so the how to understand a little bit better uh, the the loop the loop the the build measure learn loop okay basically the most important part here is to establish the hypothesis okay to define what is it that we want to learn do we want to learn um whether our customers would like to use our solution, whether our customers would be comfortable using it, whether they would be willing to switch for their current solution to our solution, because those questions are totally different. Okay. And they, they these uh, details um, mark all the difference. Okay. Then once we define that, we build the minimum, the MVP, the minimum viable, viable product that we can use to extract that learning, okay? And in the end, we just measure, did we achieve the result we were thinking about or not? And then basically we follow this process. We establish the baseline, extremely important when you uh, formulate your hypothesis. We tune the engine. So what we just saw is just one loop of the cycle right but this is going to to happen every week every two weeks or every three weeks no more than that okay so this is not one loop this is an engine in the next iteration you have to go through the whole process again okay so that's why it's also important that the process 
and we mentioned that in the first slide, I think, the process, the execution of that process, the speed of that process, it's perfectly tuned, all right? And in the end, something that, um, it's a concept that I don't know if many of you uh, know, if you're familiar with it or not, but then we have to make the decision. Do we pivot or do we persevere? We will see right now what a, what a pivot is for those of you who don't who are not familiar with the concept. But basically, this is something also that the the recommendation, even for from the, the the classical definition of the framework, is set the time. Right? It's not just let's start with the iterations, and we will decide later when to make this decision. No, we want to launch a project, right? So we start today. And then we decide, okay, in three months, exactly, we're gonna sit down and we're gonna make this decision, pivot or persevere, or in two months. And then after another two months, all right? Because otherwise you will get caught up with uh, all the workload and you will end up not, not even, without being aware of it, you will end up not making it, not being able to make this decision, all right? Okay, so, Basically, definition of pivot, in case uh, you didn't know. But a pivot is to change the direction of the, build, uh, of the business, but staying grounded in the learnings you have achieved. Okay, we've been talking about how important learning is, right? So, okay, I've learned, for example, that yes, people have a cybersecurity problem. Companies have a cybersecurity problem. We've learned that. And we've learned that they want to find a solution. And we've learned that their budget is not 1 million euros, as we said earlier. So it's just 10,000 euros. Okay, so then we pivot. Then we pivot. We keep with the same customers. We keep with the same uh, uh, problem that we want to solve. We're just trying to find another way of solving that problem, okay? And here, and a really extremely important thing because uh, this is not old theory, right? This, this has to be put into practice. Especially, I don't know, because this is an international project and uh, European level project. So different different countries, different uh, different cultures have uh, different uh, different concepts. I'm totally aware of that. So I'm going to use the example, and again, it's it's is a generalization. Okay, not everybody's like this, but there is a consensus that, for example, in Spanish culture, we we reject failure. Okay, we, in the US, if you fail, it's okay. It's okay to fail. It's part of the process, all right? Um, in some other cultures, if you fail, maybe you will be, um, yeah, people will look at you as, as uh, I don't know, you fail, okay? You're not good enough. And pivoting, even though failure is not that bad, but pivoting is not quitting, okay? It's not failing is actually improving, all right? Um, so again, as you can you can read it here, okay, but failure, the pressure to avoid failure is, is huge, but in the startup community, it's even it's even bigger, okay? Uh, if you want to, to get deeper, uh, dig deeper into this, you, you have that, the link there, okay? And, uh, oops, sorry, here, Remember how I told you earlier uh, what the MVP was and that you don't even need to build something? Okay, there are three ways, at least three, but there are many others, okay? There are three ways in which people do not even avoid creating an MVP. So it's called video MVP, concierge MVP, but they're not really MVPs because you don't have the, pro the, pro the, the product yet, okay? So what is a video MVP? It's something that can save you a lot of headaches and a lot of money. So you want to build a software to improve through artificial intelligence, to improve uh, water usage in agriculture, right? You have a couple of options. You can hire a team, uh, artificial intelligence um, engineers, developers, researchers, and then develop the solution. And in six months, you start talking to people or you go make a video with fake uh, screens. And of course, you don't lie to people. You don't tell them you have the product, but you show the product. You show what the product will look like, what the benefits of the product will look like, right? And then in a couple of days, you make a video 
You don't need to wait until you have the solution. And then you go to your potential customers. Don't go to all of them. That's why we said earlier, don't plan a big lunch, you know, like with PR, communication, et cetera. No, just go to a very small group of people and talk to them and see their feedback. If they like it, okay, uh, start recruiting the team. Okay, something like that. Then there is another approach, which is the, the concierge. Well, by the way, the video MVP, it can be a video, but it can be a website. You build a website and there is no product yet, but you you send people to your website to see if they click, if they pay, or they would like to pay. When people want, once people want to pay, maybe you show, and this is a funny anecdote that um, the author of The Lean Startup mentions, which is they spend months building something, they put up a website, and even when you pay, they design the page after you pay, say, hey, you, your payment has been successful. Thank you for buying. Here is your invoice, blah, 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 right? Okay. He said, we could have put an error page there because nobody paid. Nobody clicked in the pain button, okay? So um, this is something that can be done also through a website, for example, and it's actually done many times. Uh, another approach is the concierge MVP. The concierge MVP is similar to the to the previous one but basically it's concentrating in one or a few potential customers and focusing only of them on them using their feedback instead of you sit with your team to define the specifications you let them because you trust them you trust that they are the leaders of their sector or anything and then you trust them to to help you define the product okay and then the wizard of oz this uh, fancy name it's because actually, and this may sound crazy, but I know a, a few startups uh, that have done that. And some of them are doing that now. It's like, all right, I have a solution that uses artificial intelligence so that when you go to a, to a um, website to buy plane tickets, you don't need to tell me anything. You just write, I want to go on holidays next month to a... Um, to a place where I can uh, see the mountains. And then the artificial intelligence will understand what you what you want to do, when you want to do it, and will give you some proposal, okay? All right, that sounds pretty cool, except that it's, it's not real. There is a person behind it that when you see that, there is not a software doing it. The person will read your text and will do the job. It's, a, it's manually done, but at least they are testing whether this is a concept that people would use, okay? Even though the uh, in the back end is not done through software or through automation, there are real people doing that, okay? And this is more common than it may seem. Okay, let's use the example now of software because it's the classical example, okay? Um, you can see these little stars over here in the screen. So keep in mind of, in that part, okay? The traditional way of Software of doing software development is what it's called the waterfall, in which you define requirements, the specifications, you start the design, implementation, verification, and maintenance. Okay, this is super, and everybody can relate to this, okay, because it's traditional. The unit of progress, as we said earlier, is the advance. Okay, when you move to the next stage, you're making progress, right? And this is spectacularly good, except that only in certain settings. For example, when the problem is known and the solution is known, okay? But if you don't know what the solution is and you don't even know what the problem is, then you cannot apply this because you cannot define the requirements. You cannot define the specifications. You need to first do that work, okay? And that is what a startup is for. Then there is a, a, an evolution, which is the agile product development, okay? So then the problem is known. Now we know the problem, but we don't know the solution yet. So we we now the progress is how many line of codes we've written you know how much progress real tangible progress we, we've made right towards uh, that unknown solution but then what the lean startup proposes is as we said earlier is change all that okay because the problem is unknown the solution in an, is unknown and the unit of progress is only validated learning so you have these cycles of customer development agile development and um, and this is pretty much the, the way of doing it, okay? I, I've uh, included here this uh, Steve Blank, and you have the link in the resources page, okay? In the one, at the beginning of the, of the session when we 
share when I share the, the resources. This is the author I, I mentioned. Okay, it's a reference, and I, again, I encourage you to to read his work.